So good morning, uh, and thank you for joining us for uh, this morning's corporate finance panel, uh, following up on Mark Logley's very insightful comments regarding uh, the quest for yield, which is this year's um, topic for the uh, annual conference that we have here at the Program for Financial Studies. Let me um, start by doing the quick introduction of our very distinguished panelists. We're going to give each of them uh, about 10 minutes to introduce themselves and then tee up their own comments with regard to the quest for yield. But before I do that, let me just uh, give the quick introduction um, in the following way. First of all, as those of you who know, uh, who've been around Columbia Business School for a while know, uh, recently we changed the tagline right at Columbia Business School. So Columbia Business School is now um, Columbia Business School at the very center of business. Not just at the center of business, the very center of business. And, um, uh, and I must say, right now, I'm feeling very centered. I mean, this is exactly what Columbia Business School is supposed to be about. We've got with us um, two very distinguished uh, faculty members uh, of the finance faculty here at uh, Columbia Business School. And we have two very distinguished uh, practitioners from, um, from Wall Street here with us uh, this morning. So let me just make the quick introduction. They can spend a little more time talking, uh, uh, introducing themselves and, and teeing up their own remarks. First, uh, to my far left, we have Neng Wong. Neng is a uh, tenure member of the finance department here at Columbia Business School. Neng um, is a leading light in bringing a lot of the, uh, that, that funky stochastic calculus and uh, continuous time finance into the corporate finance realm for those of you who are interested in in um, that type of research, uh, Neng is the leading light. And he's brought a lot of that, and, and we interact a lot because he's also somebody who's very actively engaged in thinking about hedge funds and private equity funds, um, and, and in particular, uh, the compensation contracts associated with hedge funds and private equity funds. So a lot to talk about there. Um, Jennifer, to his right uh, is Jennifer Hill. Jennifer Hill is the CFO for uh, global banking and markets at uh, B of A, Bank of America. And uh, she has been on Wall Street uh, ever since graduating from uh, this distinguished institution with her MBA in 1994. Michael Bublik is a, is a partner of mine uh, at Morgan. Uh, he is the chairman of uh, M&A in the Americas uh, with it at Morgan Stanley. Michael also is a, a distinguished alum of this institution, MBA 1990. And uh, to my uh, immediate left is Patrick Bolton. He is a, also a tenured member of the faculty here, finance faculty here at Columbia Business School. Uh, Patrick, I forgot to tell you that, you know, um, when I was a young PhD student at, um, at a different institution uh, a number of years ago, uh, Patrick was already a leading light, uh, somebody whose work I had to get familiar with to meet my general examinations in, in finance. So. Um, he gives me highs when I think about it. Uh, the, the very mention of his name. In any case, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, why don't we do this? Uh, starting from uh, maybe with Nang and then moving uh, to the right. Uh, Nang, if you would just sort of give us a little bit more about your bio and in particular, the question I'd like to, us to tee up um, as we get going here is, how does the quest for yield, and read that as low in, the low interest rate environment that we're currently in, affecting um, for the academics your research, for the practitioners your specific business, and, um, and, and how do you see it unfolding here as, uh, as time goes forward? So, Nang, excuse me, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, thank you, John. Um, so let me just start by first giving uh, you a little bit uh, information about my background. Um, I've been here for 10 years um, teaching finance and real estate and uh, um, uh, I've been generally interested in, the, in uh, bridging the theory and practice of finance. Um, my research primarily falls under two subcategories. The first one is the corporate financial policy making. Now um, a little background here so far um, for students and alum and, and guests, I guess, you know, the standard corporate finance theory we teach tend to be based on uh, debt equity trade-off, you know, like how much firm should you should debt and equity. Now, that's that's great starting point, but um, having said that, if you think about sort of the uh, more elaborate level be, 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 uh, beyond just the simple debt and, tra uh, debt and equity trade-off, things such as liquidity considerations merge. In other words, the standard 
um, research or, or teaching we do as academics tend to be on the liability side. And of course, if you think about accounting statements, whether it's balance sheet or income statement or cash flow statements, they actually fundamentally tie together via the accumulation of cash, which is the you know, upper left corner of a balance sheet. And if you look at existing academic research, um, you know, it's, 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 it's limited. So uh, with Patrick, uh, also sitting on the panel here, uh, we've been actually developing a series of models to try to think uh, more about how corporate liquidity and risk management decisions along in, in, uh, you know, together jointly with, with the leverage choices. Um, now, going back to uh, John's comment about a low interest rate environment, a couple of thoughts. So actually, part of the reason we actually got into this research program is precisely the, uh, the recurrent uh, observations of a low interest rate environment. And if you think about it, um, academics, at least, I think the dominant uh, uh, working uh, assumption in, in corporate finance is markets are reasonably efficient. Now, I think that's a still open issue out there. And, uh, but whether you think markets are efficient or not, um, the fact that interest rates move over time stochastically, especially in a low interest rate environment, tend to generate optionalities, opportunities for corporate finance CFOs to time the market, maybe, you know, uh, to take advantage of the time series variation of interest rates and potentially better uh, position the firm going forward. So in other words, I guess the nutshell in, uh, for, for, for the corporate financial policy uh, line of work that Patrick and I be working on is try to think about um, how to think about interaction between the asset side and liability side of the balance sheet. It sounds kind of obvious, but it's actually not been done much uh, in existing literature, and how to take that to the next step and make that more operational. So when we communicate with CFOs and you know leading uh, I bankers here, we have a uh, uh, perhaps even more in depth conversation with the, with the leading practitioners. So that's one. Um, uh, 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 Group of uh, one, one category of what I'm working on. Um, so uh, now the second part is on the uh, asset management side. John mentioned this already. So I've been uh, very interested in uh, alternative investments in particular, including hedge funds, private equity, real assets, etc. I taught real estate finance for a number of years, and uh, through that, I got more interested in uh, and more broadly the alternatives. I think this is really exciting asset class, and if you look at the amount of assets under management, right, multi-trillion dollars for both hedge funds and uh, and private equity, the amount of academic attention that we uh, that we've devoted to the study of alternatives, including classes that our students are taking, I would say relatively, uh, are not proportional to the exposure that we get from public markets. Of course, you know they're integrated, right? I mean, one major exit for private equity would be via public markets. But having said that, in terms of research, um, you know, issues such as incentive issues contracts such as 220 or some variations of that. Um, you know, Aquino mentioned the hurdle, with 10% mm -hmm. rate of return, including management fees, and if you add that with, uh, with the hurdle. Uh, things like that, you know, design of uh, compensation contracts, how do you retain talent managers, how do you incentivize them to work in the interest of limited partners, and so on, I think it's a very fascinating subject. And then also, illiquidity of this class of investments, I think it's just fascinating from a research perspective because it, um, it it certainly uh, uh, asks us to think harder about how do we adapt the standard, you know, uh, asset markets or capital markets methodologies to, to study, you know, uh, alternatives. So, so, so in terms of research, you know, a general observation that I have, and I'm just going to probably stop here, is that, you know, in, 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 uh, in both teaching and research, we tend to have, you know, corporate finance and uh, capital markets sort of go in parallel. I mean, we have interactions across the two, but relatively speaking, I think it's, not as much as I personally would like to see. I think part of what, uh, what we do going forward, both from the research and teaching perspective, is actually try to advance to integrate the, uh, the, 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 the two um, sub-fields of, uh, of, of uh, finance. And I think we can learn uh, quite a bit from uh, both, you know, as a pricer or, or capital markets research, uh, I think there's a lot to be learned by understanding corporate finance better and vice versa. So John mentioned about my using of cash calculus a lot. It's a sort of fancy word to say um, for researchers doing capital markets. That's a sort of a commonly used methodology. But I think actually, again, this is a technical footnote here. In terms of research, I think it's the cash calculus the sort of approach. And more broadly, the asset pricing perspectives towards um, corporate finance, I think is actually quite valuable. And that's sort of uh, on the research and teaching that what Patrick and I and others are actually actively working on. So let me just stop here and turn to Jeff. Thank you. Um, 
first to, to add to um, what John had said, uh, I am actually transitioning into a, another role, which is uh, Brian Moynihan has set up a group called Simplify and Improve. Uh, and it is basically focused on operational efficiency of the bank and also making it easier to do business. Why is that? Well, because revenues at a bank are incredibly challenged and not anticipated to be going up in our strategic plan over time. So therefore, how do you remain competitive? Well, you have to actually bring your expenses down and you have to make it easier to do business um, and therefore cheaper. Uh, so that's actually what um, this strategic project that I am working on now with Brian, uh, which is a crucial initiative and plays right into the low interest rate environment. So that would suggest that we believe as a firm, um, interest rates are going to be low for the near future. Uh, so how does that affect banks? So in sitting in with my CFO hat on, uh, a, a couple of things have been incredibly challenging over the extended period that we've had historic, uh, you know, very unusually low interest rates, um, not really historic, uh, it's worse than that. And how does that affect us? Well, it affects us uh, most notably on the consumer side. We have an enormous balance sheet on the consumer side, over a trillion dollars. Um, our total balance sheet is about um, $2.1 trillion. What does that mean? It means that our mortgages now are hovering somewhere between four, well, actually 1.85% and 4%. Um, so your assets aren't earning a lot of money. However, we do fortunately have $1.1 trillion worth of deposits, that's all your money, um, that we pay almost nothing on. However, if you're, if you're talking about on average 25 basis points that you've got on the liability side, and, and, and I will segue right into your very valid comments on liquidity and capital, but just, just keeping the liquid part of the balance sheet, you know, your spread is, is only about 25 to 3%, leaving aside your cost of capital for one second. Um, which is a crucial part of the equation, so I don't need to be cavalier there, but you, you've got a $2 trillion balance sheet that's earning like 2%. That, that's not a great return uh, when, when you look at it that way, because mortgages are 30 years and you guys can pull your money at any point in time. So it's, it's, um, it's very challenging as a consumer bank. Then move into um, the, the investment banking side. You're seeing, and, and I, I'll leave it to my colleague here to, uh, discuss how the M&A market looks, but deal flow has been, it, it's picking up, but it's been relatively light. Uh, and some of that is people are restructuring their debt, but capital is still expensive, et cetera. So that business has slowed down, albeit it's picking up. Uh, I'll leave you to discuss that. Hopefully we're taking more of our share than you are, but um, <laughs> that, you know, that- Not if your business is slowing down. <laughs> <laughs> it was slowing down, starting to pick up, uh, but you know, a couple, of, a couple of tough years through that. The investment management side has done okay because it's a fee-based business. We have a very large one, so that, that has done okay, but you're looking at a combination of businesses that have been pretty challenged in a low rate environment, and we don't expect it to dramatically improve in the short term. So we're looking at cost um, implications of that and trying to bring uh, our efficiency ratio, if, if you look at it, I'll be honest, is one of the worst on the street. It's very expensive to do business um, at Bank of America. There's a couple of reasons for that though, Com coming back um, to some of the comments made about liquidity and capital. The regulatory environment for banks now requires you to keep an incredible amount of capital but more importantly, an incredible amount of liquidity. And the rules around liquidity are also fairly onerous. Uh, you don't get a lot of credit for your corporates who leave deposits with you. They don't count. Cash doesn't count. You say to yourself, that's a little bit counterintuitive. Um, so you're sitting there on cash, with cash, corporate cash, and unless it's truly an operating account, you can define it as such, it, it doesn't count. So you, you really want to relend that money uh, and try to get some yield, but there is the hunt for yield because we're being penalized for having that. So if you, you read into the liquidity rules for banks, they're pretty onerous, and in a low rate environment, they are very onerous. Um, so that's one challenge on, on the liquidity side in a low rate environment, which will improve because you'll be able to reinvest that money at higher yields um, as rates rise. The second thing is capital. Um, we keep you know, 10 plus percent core tier one capital. 
banks' cost of capital hasn't come down all that much, even though all the analysts predicted three or four years ago, with all this capital, banks should be able to capitalize very, very cheaply. Bank equity should be cheap. It's not. It's still give or take around 11% you know, for any given bank. So you've got a thicker capital base that's costing you give or take 11%. You're funding longer. So we use a, me a, a measure called time to require funding. And that is, how soon do I have to go out to the public market and actually issue anything? We have zero commercial paper now. We used to have a 10 plus billion dollar program. So we're not funding anything short term. Our time to required funding is about 33 to 36 months. So you're taking banks, which used to have a big slug of essentially overnight to 30 day funding, and you're turning it into three year funding. So although in a low rate environment that the steepness of the yield curve is pretty small, you are still incrementally increasing your cost of funding. So you take your 10% that's now in capital, which by the way in the old days used to be 4 to 6%, so you've more than doubled that, so, and that's at a higher rate. You're taking your slug of debt, which you mentioned earlier, you're talking about capital markets, is, is, the, is the balance between debt and equity. Well, your debt is now much longer term. Commercial paper is a thing of the past for financial institutions. And you're pushing it out much farther than you used to. And spreads have come in. I mean, in the, in the worst part of B of A in sort of 2005, sorry, not 2005, 2011, apologies, um, we were at 300 to 400 basis points was our CDS. So our credit spreads were that wide. That's how much it cost us to issue. Now, granted, they're now in the sort of 100 range, but bear in mind, pre-crisis, you were talking, you know, 25, 50 basis points um, was your spread to issue debt. So you've extended the maturities, you have higher credit spreads, so your cost of issuing is higher, you have more capital. So the low rate environment is really kind of good for all that. What I'm worried about is as rates rise, and we'll see what happens to the cost of capital for banks, it should come down. Um, but that, the, the overall cost of your balance sheet for a financial institution has gone up dramatically. And it is still slightly shielded by the fact we're in a low rate environment. Our revenues are constrained as well, but our funding costs and our capital costs are also at historic lows. So it's an interesting dynamic. John asked the question, you know, what do we think going forward? Well, you're gonna watch balance sheets get more expensive Therefore, banks get, continue to be more conservative. Um, so the knock-on implications for the cost of corporates to borrow, um, I believe, is going gonna, is gonna to go up because it will be absorbed by the market. Uh, corporates will have a tougher time refinancing. Hopefully, they'll, they're getting a lot of it done there. They're doing it with us. I'm sure they're doing it with you guys, too. Uh, so we're, you know, we're in that kind of environment. But it, you know, as a CFO, it's, it's an interesting time um, because there's been the pros and the cons, more capital, more liquidity, albeit at historically low prices, capital um, being the exception with credit spread. But that's really what I would say, so what are we focused on at Bank of America is really our cost base. So we need to be more efficient because revenues are going to be constrained, uh, capital is going to be expensive, debt is going to be more expensive and longer term, that's not going away. And so therefore, it needs to be cheaper to do business. Um, so that will, that will change um, the product offerings we have in the future. That will change where we're doing business. You know, the return hurdles will be higher. That's really all my comments. Great. Thanks, Jim. Alex? Yeah, so maybe just a, a quick background so you get a sense of the lens that I look through. Um, I was here at Columbia B School about 25 years ago. Met the misses here, so that was, uh, that was a good start. <laughs> I've uh, been at Morgan Stanley and the MA group since then. I, um, you know, I really, I'm involved in that effort across a few different industries. I spend most of my time with healthcare clients, a bit in the consumer space, industrial, as well as uh, I ran our tech MA practice for a number of years when the, you know, the bubble was building. So I have uh, you know, experience across uh, a number of different sectors, both here in the US primarily and also a little bit overseas. I think it's important as, as a backdrop. I mean, I think first of all, first of all, I'm gonna act a little bit like a politician because I, very respectfully listen to John's question, and I, I took it under advisement. I'm going to answer a totally different one, <laughs> which is you know how I think about Simple the question. Right? Uh, 
how I think about the quest for yield, which is really a much broader question from my perspective than you know, the low rate environment, right? I mean, I think Professor Hodrick started by saying, you know, yield is the return or the change in the price of a security plus the returns you get on top of that, which could obviously come in a variety of different forms. That's really the lens through which my clients look, right? I mean, as I, as I think about the issues that they're all trying to address, whether it be here in the States, whether it's in the pharma sector, whether it's in semiconductors, whether it's in, you know, carbonated soft drinks, I mean, everyone's looking for growth. We're in a reasonably anemic global environment as it relates to growth. I think some of the comments that Mark made earlier about the U.S., you know, being on uh, the attractive end of that spectrum are very much true, but it's still a reasonably tough environment, right? So what have, what have uh, corporates been doing? They've been spending the last few years, particularly <clears throat> during the whole financial storm, they've been spending time looking for growth, figuring out how to, <clears throat> how to perfect the middle of the income statement, a lot of what you're talking about at, at B of A, and drive the bottom line through, you know, not only obviously whatever they can find on the top line, you know, but also through improvements on, on the expense and cost structure side of the equation. And that search for growth is something that I think has very much been driving my business, which is the M&A business, because people obviously at some point, investors say, okay, you've spent the last three years perfecting your margin, you've gotten it to kind of the place of perfection relative to your business, and now you've got to drive the top line because there's no more, you know, kind of expanding the margin to get to, to the bottom line. And that ultimately uh, drives people to turn to the M&A markets and think about growth in uh, you know, inorganic ways. I think you couple that dynamic with the low interest rate environment, and I think there is uh, evidence today, certainly, and very much the possibility for an ongoing, uh, very active market in the M&A arena. Uh, if you look at uh, a number of the speakers have already mentioned, a number of the questions have addressed uh, the low rate environment, but what's particularly <coughs> unique about this environment is you know, normally what you see is when treasuries and underlying uh, rates are low, spreads increase, right, to kind of you know, accommodate for that. What we've seen here from 012, 013 this year is the underlying rates are very low and spreads are really tight. And so that means across the credit spectrum, whether you're a single A or a triple B or wherever you are, you have access to capital today that's probably highly unusual relative to history, probably not sustainable, and probably an opportunity to at least think creatively about taking advantage of that. You know, there's a number of companies out there like J&J &J that still maintain kind of the triple A you know, my view is that there was a time and a place for that, and there's an advantage to that, certainly, and there's certain markets in which that pays off. In this market, it's not really an advantage because you have, you know, you have folks that are not investment grade that are issuing debt and, you know, with a forehandle on it. And so that really gives access to capital to a lot of different companies. That makes M&A very tempting because if you have low cost access to capital and if you're using cash to fund your deals as opposed to stock, which is different, if you're using cash to fund your deals, then almost by definition, almost irrespective of what you're buying, as long as it's somewhat profitable, is actually gonna be EPS accretive, right? So you have, this, you, know, you have this tremendous push by corporates, by boards, by senior management to go pursue transactions because there's so many things they can do that are accretive to their EPS growth rate, well, you know, which sounds like a great thing. What's the problem? The problem is that we're in a low growth environment. And so therefore, there still needs to be, relative to your cost of capital, there still needs to be a return on that capital. Right? And so the ROIC in a low growth environment is challenging. So as we pencil out all these transactions for corporates, you know, inevitably the cash issuer in a deal in this environment is quite likely to find transactions that are EPS accretive. But when they do the math and look at their cost of capital, whether that's you know, 10, 11% for a bank, whether it's 7, 8% for other folks with lower betas, you know, it's still reasonably high relative to the kinds of returns that one might expect from those targets. So most of the deals we're seeing that look attractive at first blush, the reason they die on the vine is because they you just can't justify the return on invested capital. If you can't get that return above your cost of capital in a two, three, four year time frame, then you really have to ask yourself, are you creating value, right? If you're putting capital to work that costs you more than the return you're getting for it, you got a problem. Uh, so that's, that's a lot of the dynamic that I think is driving, you know, kind of my sector and my, in my industry. Uh, but I also think there's a lot of, uh, kind of secondary trends and dynamics that are starting to form, which, which very much fall into this category of you know, the quest for yield. And so some examples, the, the activist community. I mean, we've never seen a more active activist community, and you know, we all know the names of some of the, you know, the icons out there and the Ackmans that are trying to figure out how to get yield. Why is that community all of a sudden getting so much focus and so much attention? Because it's a real asset class, people have poured a lot of money into it, 
Uh, they've had disproportionate returns relative to the market. And so, you know, folks are looking for yield. So they're pushing money towards the activists. And the activists are now in a, in a mode where they're rebel rousing. They're knocking on corporate's doors and saying, you know, you should sell, you should break up, you should return capital, you need new management. A lot of them are, you know, 31 years old or have never run a company, looking across the table at a CEO who's 60 who's run his company for her company for 30 years. And, you know, they, they think they've got the answer. So there's a little bit of an inefficiency in all that. But the reason that the activist community is getting such attention and such support from institutionals, from long onlys and others, is because they're returning capital. You know, they're driving yield and they're producing some results. So that's just, a, in my mind, as I think about quest for yield, you know, that's quest for yield, right? Then you look at restructuring. So I worked a couple years ago with Abbott Labs on their split up. They made those, you know, kind of the biggest company in Chicago. Uh, and the CEO decided the, the environment in U.S. pharmaceuticals was simply too low growth to justify coupling that business with the higher growth businesses that he saw in the remainder of Abbott. So separated the two companies, you had basically a $90 billion company, which ultimately split into two that are now, uh, well, one's about 80 and the other one's about 60. So if you think about the value creation, it's actually been extremely meaningful, even if you, you know, account for the, uh, the uptick in the market. And the thesis behind that is the investors in AbbVie, which is the spun-off pharmaceutical entity, the investors in AbbVie are looking for a different profile. They're looking for a different quest for yield. They want a dividend. You know, the guys that are the folks that want to invest in Abbott want growth. They don't care about a dividend. It's a fundamentally different investment thesis. You can't possibly blend these two bodies of investors together to get kind of a, a mean or a median. You have to separate them. And it was a you know, perfectly correct corporate finance thesis and the way it was executed and ultimately deployed into the market, it proved to be extremely value creative. There's not a deal, a buy side that Abbott could have done that could have driven the tens of billions of dollars of value that they created by separating two businesses. That was a quest for yield. You know, the last example that I'll, I'll toss out there before I turn it over is uh, inversions. You know, we're hearing a lot about corporate inversions and the government's kind of running around struggling to figure out how to put the finger in the dike and and uh, to stop U.S. entities from, from going overseas. You know, we've seen uh, companies like Medtronic and like Pfizer and like AbbVie and others either try or succeed in, in uh, basically taking their structure to, uh, you know, to, to more attractive tax havens, whether that's Ireland, the U.K., Switzerland, Netherlands, whatever it is. You know, there's a lot of my clients who are saying, find me an inversion target. I gotta get out of here. And the reason they have to get out of here because the U.S. tax regime is not competitive. Right? And as a result, they're looking, you know, and, and their competitors are all in foreign jurisdictions that have a better uh, you know, overall tax uh, environment, and by definition, they're not being competitive. So from small entities to 200 plus billion dollar entities, I mean, the mandate is find me a place where I can go take my business overseas. And that's, I mean, my, in my mind, that's kind of scary. And I'm not sure I have a client that hasn't in some form, hasn't in some form or fashion uh, challenged us to help them see if there's an overseas answer they can go pursue. Now, I think that part is going to end because obviously Treasury and other, you know, others in, in D.C. are trying to figure out a way to solve the problem. The way to solve the problem is the way the U.K. solved the problem, which is to fundamentally restructure, have tax reform, and have companies voluntarily come back because all of a sudden they're competitive. The way the U.S. is trying to solve the problem is kind of close the tax loopholes because they think of them as loopholes, right? Uh, you know, in my mind, inversions are a quest for yield. Because I'm looking for a return, I'm looking to drive the price of my equity, and if I, can, if I can live in an environment that's got a lower tax rate and that has access to OUS cash without paying repatriation, by definition, I've created yield. Right? So the idea of yield is so broad-based. I mean, yes, absolutely, the low cost, you know, intra, the low interest rate environment is very much at the center of it, but the low growth and what people are doing to drive the change in the price of their securities and to think about how to, super, you know, how to superimpose that with buybacks, with dividends, with other forms of return of capital. You know, in my mind, that's really what we're, what we're dealing with. On a, on a personal note, I guess I'm, I'm tired of getting the 15 or 20 bits that B of A has to offer on my checking account, so I've recently joined an, an angel investor club, so I'm, I'm seeking my own deal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see how I do. But anyway, that's, uh, that's a little bit you on You can always I... come back. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Taking matters into his own hands. Thank you. Uh, Patrick? Uh, so it's a great pleasure to uh, speak on this panel. And uh, I, um, we've heard, I think, incredibly insightful uh, uh, 
comments and observations already, uh, and I want to return to some of them. But let me start by saying uh, a little bit uh, about um, who I am uh, and w what kind of research I do. So uh, I've been here for nine years at Columbia, uh, and uh, my broad area of research is in uh, corporate finance. Um, I teach corporate finance at the moment, and I also teach uh, uh, a class on financial crises and uh, regulatory responses. As a matter of fact, we had a conference yesterday at the law school, a uh, quite interesting conference on the later developments. I'm sure that you are following those closely. Um, and, uh, and much of my research is uh, with, uh, with Neng. I'm, uh, it's a privilege to be working with Neng. Uh, uh, it's a, f a fantastic collaboration, and uh, and um, he he already put uh, uh, described quite well uh, uh, what we are doing, and uh, let me just emphasize what he said. Um, we are um, uh, looking at corporate finance through the lens of liquidity and the lens of cash, and um, this is an incredibly productive uh, way of looking at corporate finance. In fact. Uh, it sheds light on what uh, both of you just said, uh, uh, your own experience, uh, uh, and I want to comment on that uh, a little later. Um, but let me start by uh, giving my perspective on uh, uh, Quest for Yield and uh, what we heard this morning in the keynote. Um, so uh, I want to take it back to when I joined Columbia. Uh, I had the privilege to, uh, the year I joined uh, Columbia, to be uh, at the Economic Club uh, listening to the first uh, major speech uh, uh, Ben Bernanke gave as governor of the Fed. Okay, this is in 2005. And what was he talking about? He was talking about global savings glut. Uh, he was giving incredibly uh, insightful and uh, sophisticated uh, analysis of what was driving uh, low, low interest rates and uh, how he and the Fed were thinking about the, the, uh, the future uh, in terms of interest rates. So it's sort of interesting, it was a very, at the time, you know, he was just recently a central banker, had been an academic all his life. It was a very academic uh, speech for a central banker. And uh, I had the, the person sitting to my left sort of losing track of what was being said. And at the end of uh, Ben Bernanke's speech, he turned to me and said, um, so what do you think? Uh, is the Fed going to raise interest rates? <laughs> 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 um, but uh, so uh, you know, let, me, let me try and, uh, and, and uh, repeat some of the points that uh, Ben made, uh, and hopefully you know, not sound too academic uh, in the process. Um, so you know, why do we have low interest rates uh, today, and why is the, f the the best forecast, why is the market forecasting low interest rates? Um, one major uh, uh, reason what we heard post-crisis is uh, the huge uh, liquidity that was pumped into the economy, global economy by central banks. Um, but let me take it back to 2005, before the crisis. That was already a low interest rate environment, a lo already uh, um, markets were forecasting their low interest rates, you know, 10 years, 30 years forward. And what was the, the main reason then? Because you can't really say that the, in 2005 it was a very, uh, you know, a very um, uh, aggressive uh, in environment in terms of uh, pumping liquidity into the global economy for central banks. So what was really driving lo uh, uh, low interest rates? Globally, well, this is sort of the main point that uh, Ben Bernanke was making. Is globally, what we're seeing is we're seeing a huge and growing savings pool, uh, a, lo a lot of it coming from Asia, and we're seeing a lack of um, uh, savings vehicles to park that money. And uh, what are we seeing today? Uh, just as what we, have, what we heard from both of you, we're seeing um, globally still a lack of uh, a production of, of savings vehicles. N ni neither the banking sector nor, nor the way you put it uh, in, in M&A, we see a lot of growth. We don't see a lot of investment. We don't see a lot of corporate investment. As long as we have savings grow uh, and uh, investment being slow, 
we're going to have a low interest rate environment. Whether, whether central banks um, uh, retire or shrink their balance sheet or not. Um, but you know, on the, on the, on the, on the central bank uh, balance sheet uh, uh, point, so um, the Fed has decided to stop growing its balance sheet and we're, we're forecasting a slow shrinking of the, uh, of the Fed balance sheet. Uh, that could uh, <coughs> result eventually in, uh, in higher interest rates. But look at uh, what Japan just uh, decided to do. Uh, uh, the Japanese central bank decided to grow its balance sheet by 15% of GDP per year. Um, look at, uh, uh, look at uh, the environment in China. Environment in China, high increase in savings, and we see a, a slowdown in investment. Um, what about Europe? Well, Europe should be doing what Japan does. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, uh, it's doing its best. Uh, but Europe is also trying to, you know, uh, Mario Draghi said 1.2 trillion increase in the ECB's balance sheet. Uh, now, when that will happen, that's another question. But uh, uh, we, you know, you know we will, we're seeing uh, uh, continued, continued uh, global expansion of central bank balance sheets. Um, so that's still going to depress uh, I interest rates. And then you might ask, well, why are central banks doing this? Um, and uh, that brings me uh, to another point, which um, so this is more from a corporate finance perspective, which I think is really important. It hasn't been uh, mentioned uh, so far, at least not in the keynote, but it was implicit in a lot of the comments that were made. And that is that what we've seen uh, post-crisis is um, despite uh, all the best efforts of, of uh, sovereigns, of corporates, and households, we've seen very high debt, uh, uh, um, uh, very high um, um, debt overhang, and and very little progress except for the U.S. in deleveraging, and that's uh, that's uh, that is basically uh, an important reason why we're not seeing we're not seeing investment uh, picking up. Um, so that's, uh, so I wanted to give a little bit of context on, uh, on why I expect uh, interest rates to remain uh, low for the foreseeable future. Uh, and uh, that is not good news. I was going to turn to, uh, uh, I thought, extremely insightful analysis you gave. Um, so yes, yesterday, I, I, uh, in, in my um, uh, banking class, uh, my financial crisis class, I gave a, 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 the topic was uh, capital requirements, liquidity requirements, and I wish you had been in that class <laughs> because you would have put it uh, perfectly. And and one of the points I, one of the points I, I tried to make, uh, which is very much in uh, in line with what you were saying, is that in all the regulatory efforts to make uh, a banks more resilient, one thing it, that has been completely absent in the discussion. Is uh, is the is the business model of banks, and and when, at what point will uh, the business model of banks no longer be profitable? At what point will we be seeing you know banking basically disappearing because costs are too high, and uh, and uh, revenues are too low? The way you've put it, uh, we're we're we're, the, we're right there. It's very close. Uh, for for Bank of America uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a shame that you, you have to you, it's a shame that in in a very low interest rate environment it's a shame that your priority is, is cutting costs. So Patrick, uh, you, thank you for raising um, that point because I do think it is an important point. Let me just sort of make the observation that when Mark Logley made his comments, he showed that. Um, the low interest rate environment we're, we're in today is not completely without precedent. In other words, um, if you go back to the post-World War II period, um, you have another long period of stable and low interest rates. And a number of you um, referenced uh, what I would like to put directly on the table, which is globalization, the effects of globalization on um, the prospects for interest rates. Uh, before we get there even, what I'd like to do is sort of, if you would, because I know, Jennifer, you've spent some time abroad 
uh, Ning, as you have Michael, I assume when you say you're chairman of the M&A Americas, that's plural, more than just the America, America. so um, uh, providing some color with regard to how things have changed since your time at, at Columbia um, and your own experiences uh, on Wall Street and how they have or have not become more global and what the implications might be. Uh, a number of you touched on them. Let me just sort of uh, r raise a couple of points. Inversions um, and, and how globalization might be affecting them. Um, the global sa savings glut was mentioned. Uh, one thing I'll put on the table as uh, private equity uh, investors, my, my day job, are the rise of sovereign wealth funds. Uh, the first time I even heard the term sovereign wealth fund was right here at the Columbia Business School when a student asked me, uh, what do you think about the rise of sovereign wealth funds? And I had no idea what a sovereign wealth fund was um, because the term is a relatively new term. It is a term that really wasn't in use, um, certainly in the broad lexicon, say 15 years ago. And um, just some comments perhaps from, from anybody on the panel who'd like to, uh, to talk about that. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, I, I, I've been Columbia for 10 years, and just give you a little bit, one data point, uh, my own observation. So five years ago, I wouldn't get any calls from my Chinese friends or friends' friends or, you know, you name them. Nowadays, I would say I get calls at least every other day or emails seeking out for opportunities. So clearly, the global savings glut is in action. Uh, actually, I, was, I had two meetings yesterday with two friends introduced by my friends. So it's a small world, you know, WeChat is working super well and everybody's on it from Asia and China. And it's just incredible how things are done. And, um, you know, not long ago, a couple months ago, um, I bought a uh, insurance company from China, not the marquee names, you know, it's like second tier in terms of size of the insurance companies from China, but uh, acquired uh, Waterfall Story, yeah? right, at $1.95 billion, very low cap rate. Actually, I had the chance to talk to the guy who did the deal from, from the China side. And uh, this is just one example that capital is flowing in. Now, in the old days, we tend to think that in emerging markets, right, that's where capital is going to go to, right, you know, from the developed, de developing countries. Now it's the other way around. At least you see that there's more of a sort of a two-way uh, flow uh, back to the inversion uh, point. So, so my personal experience, and also by talking to... Uh, you know, um, folks who are actually um, making decisions, not only just in the private sector, but also at the government. You know, like you know, John mentioned the sovereign wealth funds. If you speak to CICs or SAFEs or you know, GICs and you know, these uh, uh, big guys, uh, clearly the demand is huge. I was in Asia for uh, uh, Pan Asian, um, Singapore for Pan Asian uh, Columbia alum reunion event was, uh, last month. And uh, you know, clearly GIC real estate had bought a lot of assets recently in, in North America. And uh, if you look at the high net worth individuals, um, I just read the report by, uh, uh, used to be by Merrill Lynch, what is it, you must know this, um, by um, Capgemini, I guess. Um, so the three groups, in the North America is still number one if you count high net worth individuals uh, assets, savings, $10 trillion, I guess. In Europe is, I guess, I guess the second. But Asia is growing at the rate of 15, 20 percent, and it's already around 10 trillion dollars. So well, so these are um, assets seeking for yields, right? And um, you know, in general equilibrium, which is what uh, equilibrium, you know, Patrick was referring to, and that's going to keep the at least demand side, okay? It's going to keep the yields uh, for the foreseeable future, I think, as a, enough for a major force to keep the yields relatively low. And also, I want to br broaden the notion of a quest for yield a little bit along uh, our panelists here. So that is, it's not just literally comparing risk just to the yields. There's also huge demand driven by diversification from Asia, right? You know, uh, I was in Asia for three weeks uh, in October and then met a couple of ultra rich people. And you just ask them, you say, okay, how much money do you have? Guys, you couldn't sort of even recognize, sort of just by casual observation, probably has a chance of having 100 million yuan or, you know, somewhere in the ballpark. You, you will be shocked. And then the question is asking, okay, how do you deploy assets? Mm -hmm. Well, easy, buy credit products in China. But, okay, great. So, but there's just so much you get to do, right? So you see there's a huge um, creation of, uh, now it's still a little bit cottage industry, but I would say soon you will, that is trying to collect all the money and try to find ways to channel to the states. So I think that will be a, 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 a additional source of money that's going to keep the interest rate low. So 
and they're not looking for super high yields, yeah. like 15, 20. They're looking for a lot lower yield. Why? Because of diversification. Like you don't want all the eggs in one basket. And, and so. this is a relatively recent phenomenon, right. the, the whole China phenomenon. Jennifer and Michael, do you guys have any, a point of view on A, you know, what was just said about um, the low, prospects for low interest rate environment, and how that might affect your business, businesses, well, respective business? Just a comment to stay on your globalization comment. Um, financial institutions are going in the reverse direction due to regulation. And regulators and their rules on capital are forcing capital be, to be kept locally. So they're actually discouraging the arbitrage among regulators uh, is driving business. Right now, financial institutions, and I'll get in trouble for uh, actually saying this out loud, but um, financial institutions in the United States are much better off than our European counterparts because we are actually able to move capital and liquidity around a little bit more freely. The UK has, because of their experience with Lehman Brothers, is ring fencing capital and ring fencing businesses and requiring them to be separately capitalized and separately uh, have liquidity thresholds. So you're driving businesses in a much more um, isolated manner. Asia hasn't yet gotten there um, because the, the crisis was different in Asia. Uh, so for financial institutions, they are becoming actually, in my 27 years of working, are becoming in some ways less global, which I think is actually a dangerous thing. Uh, the, the requirement to, to keep things in home country, legal entities are now less global and less cross-border. It makes capital more expensive and it makes uh, liquidity more expensive. So because you're, you're limiting the flow cross-border. Interesting. So uh, less global financial institutions as the world is becoming more global. Uh, seeds seeds food for thought there as, you, uh, as I turn to the audience for Q&A. Michael, you have any comments on uh, globalization and yeah, I guess, uh, Well, I mean, my client base, and, and, and I don't serve the FIG community in terms of the, the financial institutions, but my client base, it's a bit different, right? I mean, everyone's thinking in a much broader sandbox, right? So I, I mentioned before, I work with some tech companies. The, very few of them have their foundries here in the U.S. anymore, right? I mean, they're all looking for low-cost manufacturing. That's a phenomenon that, you know, maybe it's not new, but it's not that old either. Uh, you know, I worked on... Uh, I hadn't worked on a deal in India in my, at that point, 20 years at Morgan Stanley in the last five since then, you know, I've worked on about six of them. Uh, I mean, people are looking for growth, looking for yield, looking for this, you know, quest for yield in, in all different areas up and down, whether it's, you know, thinking about how, how they can drive the, the top line or thinking about how they can, again, you know, squeeze out those, those costs by low cost manufacturing, whatever the case may be. Um, but my clients are definitely thinking with a much bigger view as to, I mean, their sandbox is the globe, right? And some of them come to the conclusion, rightly, that it doesn't make sense to go international, right? I mean, in some of the pharmaceutical distrib distributors, as an example, is there really an advantage to being a global distributor? I don't know. I mean, maybe one plus one is just two, and it's more difficult to manage, and you should stay in the U.S. You know, I, I remember a funny story. I was born in Prague, and I was there a number of years ago. This was 2001, I think. I was there with my mom and my brother. We're kind of late for something in the morning and then we're in the hotel lobby drinking coffee and I said to the guy in Czech, I said, you know, can I have a cup to go? My mom was horrified and he looked at me like, what do you, you know, well, you, you can't take the porcelain cup out of the hotel and I was like, well, yeah, but I kind of like a styrofoam cup. To go. <laughs> My mom's like, that's not a thing here. You know? They don't have styrofoam. The, the reason you drink coffee is because you're sitting down and enjoying your little porcelain cup and your coffee. And so I, I said, look, I guarantee you there's people walking all, all over Prague with cups of coffee because I'm used to seeing it here, right? And she's like, no, it's not. So anyway, so I lost the dollar, I lost the bet, uh, I didn't see anyone all day with a cup of coffee. I was in Prague last week on business for a board meeting. I mean, you couldn't turn the corner without, you know, uh, hitting into a Starbucks. And so, I mean, that's, that's just in the course of whatever it was, 13 years, right? And it's a, it's a dramatic time. There's Mickey D's and Starbucks and you can drink coffee all day on the streets and get happy. But uh, it's, uh, it's a very different environment. So that's just a small example where obviously the, you know, the, the brand name and the distributor you know, prowess that a Starbucks has makes sense to take that, you know, just like Pepsi and Coke and everyone else, take that around the globe wherever you can. Uh, it's just a different kind of company by company, industry by industry question, but they're all asking it. Great. Any questions from the audience? Uh, do we have a mic? Jennifer Wynn. Well, 
Jennifer, when you spoke about uh, the effect of regulation on capital and liquidity constraints, a third uh, consequence has been the enormous growth of both risk and compliance units, uh, both for long-established long rules like uh, Basel, but also in the States, particularly for CCAR. And do you, since you're now going to be focused on efficiency, do you view that as a transient cost or a material and permanent uh, cost that's going to be difficult to get rid of and therefore will affect how easy it will be to increase efficiency? That's actually, you hit the nail on the head. That's actually one of the hard, hardest areas because you're sitting there trying to become more efficient and at the same time, the regulators are saying, you are not going to shed a single risk, compliance, uh, audit uh, person at all. And so it is incredibly challenging. I mean, you, you saw uh, JP Morgan came out about a year ago and said, we're going to spend $2 billion on that. Well, in my mind, just buy a law firm uh, and bring them all in-house. Because it, it, it is the burden is incredibly high. and we have a phrase for it, it's the checkers checking the checkers. Um, you know, it's, I, I make the allusion to sort of the TSA. I, when you get your passport checked four times before you go through security, do you feel safer? Not necessarily, but you have to do it and you have to tick the box. And, you know, some of it is, I think the pendulum will swing back slightly. Listen, banks got it so horribly wrong, and we didn't have even the checkers there. Never mind the checkers checking the checkers. So, you know, we are in the penalty box. It's going to be for a long term uh, period of time, but I do think over time it will become, instead of form over substance, which is a little bit what it is today, it will become more substantive, and it, it's needed. Things like operational risk. When I first started in risk management at, at Goldman, gosh, in 96, there was no such thing as op risk. And if you think about it, that's one of the biggest things a bank faces uh, is operational risk. So the focus on, on the substantive issues, we're not quite there yet, but there's a lot more sensible talk among the regulators of let, let's actually check the stuff that's really going to get us into trouble. But, you know, again, it's the bane of our existence. It's, uh, those, those departments are, are now much larger than our M&A department, which actually makes a lot of money for us. So it's, you know, that's the wrong way around. But uh, we'll get there. But we have to pay the price. We, we deserve to pay the price. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, a question right there in the front. Hi. I was surprised by, Jennifer, I was surprised by your comments about uh, what will happen when interest rates rise because the, what I've heard from, what I think most uh, of the bank CEOs have said is that when interest rates rise, those deposits are going to be vastly more, um, uh, they're going to be worth a lot more and it's going to take longer for the deposit, what, what you all have to pay depositors, uh, it's going to take long, longer for those assets to reprice. So if you can comment on that. No, I completely agree. You know, our $1.1 trillion worth of free deposits, essentially, um, it, it takes a much longer time for those to reprice. But you also have to, you know, it takes time to rebuild your asset side um, at the higher yields. So a mortgage book is 30 years. If you've got a fixed rate mortgage at 4%, you're, you're not going to refi at 8%. Uh, and unfortunately, if you're looking at the market now, um, despite the fact that rates are low, first-time home buyers is still incredibly tight. We're not seeing the growth in that side of the market yet, even though rates are low. And part of that is because regulation, et cetera, has made it that much more difficult to issue credit. So the credit market is still lagging. That's okay in the lower rate environment, but will banks be facile enough to take advantage as rates rise of issuing credit to match the spread between, because you don't reprice your deposits. We, commercial banks and consumer banks like high rate environments um, because of that discrepancy, which you so rightly mentioned. So margins will come back up, but you've also got to have the growth. You've got to be underwriting the business. Now, we are, Wells is, JP is, the PNCs, the, you know, we're all writing mortgages, but at a much, much lower sort of velocity uh, than the old days. So you're balancing velocity, refreshing of the book with 
um, with where deposit prices will start to rise over time. So bef We're still not going to pay you for your deposit. Before we go on, <laughs> um, before we move on, actually, with the next question, let me just sort of push, um, Michael, you had mentioned um, that one of the things that the large multinationals are doing is moving, um, I, think, I don't think you used the term, but moving to more growth-oriented markets, maybe the emerging markets. Um, do you have a point of view as to how um, how that's being modulated? Do you think there's too much of that, not enough of that, and um, how do you see that playing uh, unfolding going forward? Well, I, I definitely see uh, I definitely see the boundaries just being much more open and people thinking much more aggressively about kind of the global model, right? I mean, I I have a a, a bit of a unique slice of the world in that most of the clients that I serve are. You know, they're large cap, they tend to be international, uh, so I have a little bit of a bias. I, I don't spend a lot of time with, you know, kind of the, the startups or, or entities that, you know, that perhaps are going to stay in their own geographies for some time. So, you know, again, recognizing that bias, uh, you know, I certainly, I, I think that people's enthusiasm for some of the, you know, whether it's the BRIC countries or otherwise, you know, the growth seems a little bit more tempered and a little bit more fraught with danger than what people may have thought five, ten years ago, right? So the idea of buying in Russia or Brazil or, you know, even China, I mean, there is, uh, there, there comes along with that a, and I'm talking about from an M&A perspective now, acquiring entities that are there, I, I think there really comes along with it a, a diligence um, level that requires a pretty high standard, right? I think a lot of the business practices for some of the entities overseas are, I mean, they're not as regulated, you know, perhaps some of the practices would be frowned upon under kind of U.S. standards, and I think that some folks have learned their lessons by buying targets overseas in some of these countries and recognizing that, well, gee, you know, maybe I actually can't recognize the revenue that I thought I'd be able to recognize because it was, you know, there's some, you know, foreign corrupt practices or other, and I'm not saying it's illicit or bad or illegal, it's kind of different, it's less regulated, and it's not... You know, it's not consistent with U.S. standards to a large extent. So I think it's a little bit of fits and starts, uh, but at the same time, there's no question in my mind that as companies look to, to grow and as we're talking about the multi-billion dollar, you know, the, the 20, 50, 100, 200 billion dollar entities, uh, you're not going to find, even, even though the U.S. has, you know, disproportionately attractive growth at this point in time, I mean, you have to, even if the growth is high, maybe the manufacturing costs are lower elsewhere. So there's another way to play that. And I, I don't see that as a trend that's going away. I mean, if anything, my colleagues around the globe, you know, whether they be in Asia or, or you know, Latin America or wherever, are much more important to my practice and understanding, you know, the trends and having the insights and having the, the connections, uh, you know, in these foreign jurisdictions is in, incredibly important for my U.S. clients. Patrick, you've been an observer of corporate finance now um, for a bit. Um, these uh, global, uh, this globalization, this trend towards globalization that we've seen more recently, um, is this something that is transitory or something that's more permanent in your, in, in your thoughts? Um, well, I think the long-term trend is uh, towards more globalization, uh, despite the, the fact that regulation is driving uh, uh, some retrenchment in, uh, in, the, in the large uh, global cities. Uh, uh, let me, let me uh, take... Uh, say a word about Southern Wealth Funds, because you raised that earlier, yeah. and uh, I've been involved a little bit with uh, Southern Wealth Funds, and uh, there's an interesting perspective with respect to chasing yields, because Southern Wealth Funds are now sitting on, on uh, huge uh, pools of cash. They have to find ways of uh, generating returns. They've been extremely conservative. They've been mostly in fixed income, mostly in treasuries, and they've Slowly, if you take, for example, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, they have um, gone more into equities, but they're finding that their uh, equity returns or their, uh, or their fixed income returns are really not that great. And so they're looking for alternative assets. What are those alternative assets? Um, Neng mentioned one, which is real estate. Uh, I think an interesting uh, other alternative asset, which is massively under uh, explored is uh, infrastructure investment. So that's what the point I wanted to make. Um, uh, so I have here the numbers, uh, there's a McKinsey study uh, um, that puts the you know, global, global infrastructure demand uh, over the next um, uh, 15 years is at uh, about $60 trillion. 
That means that uh, from, from uh, now going forward, you have to uh, um, budget. If, if, if uh, we were meeting that demand, you'd have to budget about uh, $2.5 trillion in infrastructure investment globally. But it's not really happening. It's certainly not happening in the US. US is in very uh, deep need in, uh, uh, to renew its infrastructure. And, and, and the point is, so uh, what's happening at the sovereign wealth funds? So some of the major sovereign wealth funds, they are building huge infrastructure investment teams. They're, bu uh, they're building uh, in-house expertise and they're looking uh, globally uh, to invest in infrastructure. Where is a lot of that inf investment going to be? Well, chances are it's going to be uh, mostly in Asia. Uh, why is that? Well, we, we've, uh, we've learned that uh, China, uh, together with a number of other Asian countries, is setting up a new infrastructure investment bank, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. The, uh, uh, the total uh, equity capital that's already been uh, uh, dedicated to that bank is, uh, is uh, of the order of uh, uh, $50 billion. The target is $200 billion. They're planning to borrow uh, at, uh, at a triple A, uh, no, a double A rating. They're going to be multiplying their balance sheet by 20 for their, for their, you know, their equity base. So there's, the money will be there. There's going to be tons of infrastructure investment. Uh, they're looking for projects. And where are those projects going to be? Uh, a lot of them are going to be in India. So you were mentioning BRICS. We should be taking the B and the R out of BRICS, and we're left with I, uh, I, C, and S. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, you know, chances are that, that that's where we're going to see uh, a lot of uh, a lot of growth opportunities. Interesting. Um, question. Two questions. One for Michael. Um, do you foresee um, a tax reform, at least with respect to the corporates, um, can happen in the foreseeable future? And then second one to know regard, regarding the uh, word of deal, was it, uh, do you know, was it uh, a miss of the minds uh, over time or who initiated that? Thanks. You know, Tom, I'm, not, I'm not a tax expert. I would suggest on tax reform, uh, there, the, you know, the news out of Washington has kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit. I think there was a little bit of a point, uh, point in time not so long ago where it looked for the first time in a while there may be some form of tax holiday like we've had previously, where there's a period of time in which you know, people can repatriate uh, their cash for lesser rates. I think the view on that is now dimming. You know, obviously with things changing in Washington as it relates to uh, kind of the political aspects and Republicans versus Democrats would have a different point of view on that. Uh, you know, the, the market is really mixed. I mean, I have a number of clients that are extremely close to uh, the tax authorities in D.C. that have a really informed point of view. Most of them are pessimistic on overall tax reform. Some of them are wildly optimistic, right? I mean, I think the, the overall view is that a, a, an overall comprehensive tax reform, which in everyone's, everyone I talk to says that's the right answer, but I think people are reasonably pessimistic that that's actually going to happen. But I think that at the end of all this, uh, I think there will be some in intelligent uh, steps that are taken at some point here because it's becoming reasonably clear that the U.S. is losing competitiveness by virtue of their you know, tax system, uh, that companies are doing uh, what I would call kind of unintended consequences or pursuing unintended consequences to get around that. And I think the idea of you know, thinking of those as loopholes or things that you want to constrict or somehow you know, call unpatriotic is a little goofy. I think the way you should think about it is stepping back and saying, okay, well, what is it about our system that ultimately is uncompetitive? Why are some of our leading corporates looking to, you know, exit or do things that will dramatically change, you know, the way that they pay their taxes? Uh, and I think, uh, I think there's actually a reasonably intelligent way to go about it. It's interesting how little, I forget the actual number, it's something exceedingly small, like 7%. I mean, the actual basis of tax revenue that comes into the government from corporate taxes is actually quite low relative to the overall tax pool that comes in. So you would think that you know, there'd be some pretty smart ways. It's such a hot, hot button, and you start losing companies like the Pfizer's of the world, you know, obviously that, those, those uh, discussions seem to be dormant, but nonetheless, when companies like that start thinking about going overseas, you can well imagine the folks in Washington take notice. Thanks. Okay, um, 
about the water deal? Well, I, I clearly cannot, I mean, not that I know a lot about the details, detail, um, the deal's detail, but uh, I guess just using this uh, question as an example to talk about what I sort of at least feel um, based on um, what I've been uh, uh, experiencing by talking to different people. Now, um, the fact that overseers come to buy marquee names, iconic buildings in New York City or in the US, this is not the first time. Okay. Japanese came in the 80s. We wish it could have turned out to be better than they actually did. But um, So I think that hopefully investors uh, out there um, are aware of this. I think they are. And, um, now, on one end of the table, it was Jonathan Gray, whom the key, our keynote speaker today mentioned in his uh, speech. Uh, on the other side, it's, it's a fast-growing, liquidity-flushed insurance company that is doing global acquisition now. You know, I think they just bought a, a couple of insurance companies actually in Europe, and uh, so my sense is. Um, I think my, my, I mean, I'm not speaking, of course, for the insurance company or anybody, but my sense is, I think the general observation is uh, there's demand for diversification. Um, and I think that does make a lot of sense, right? Because, you know, it, China, as big as it is, is only, I guess, 10 some percent of the global GDP. And I think for, uh, you know, a major institution, I think it makes a lot of sense for them to, to go out. I think there's a lot of challenges for them to do that, I think. But the value add proposition for value add is humongous. We have a, you know, Mike here who's an, you know, an expert on M&A. And my sense is that there's a huge demand by a lot of Chinese companies or, 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 or you know, other markets too, I guess, to, to, to increase efficiency in their, in their production. You know, there's a lot of value created. There's a lot of wealth created in a very short period of time. You know, I came to this country from China after finishing my undergrad in 92, 22 years ago. It was a completely, totally different world, right? I mean, 22 years, you know. Uh, you know, when, when I came to this country, if, if a household had $10,000, that would be viewed as super ultra rich, okay, in, in, in China. Nowadays, of course, you know, you, you don't even make it to the middle class, probably. You know, you're certainly in the big cities. So, um, so, 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 I mean, um, so my sense is the globalization, you know, going back to John's con uh, question, I think in the long run, I agree with Patrick, and I think it's permanent, more likely to be permanent. Mm -hmm. Along the way, we're gonna have a lot of bumps, a lot of volatility, you know, it's gonna be, you know, excess volatility, that's, that's sort of what it is we got, you know, and the capital flow will be huge, and uh, it's subject to uh, market sentiments and, uh, and fundamentals too, so, so, but I'm cautiously optimistic, I do think you know, uh, in for the foreseeable future, rates will be low for these reasons because people are still trying. They're still trying to learn the language, uh, how to do business here. They try to move their production here for diversification. They try to find value add. So, so people are trying. The question is, and I think that creates a lot of opportunities in the marketplace. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, another question in the back there. It seems that uh, the hurdle rates are the the quest to find total return is an issue and it's leading to lower investment and companies have a lot of cash on their balance sheet. To what extent does that, is that a, uh, a problem with regards to companies not lowering their cost of capital given the lower rates? Are they using a cost of capital that's historical and that's basically leading to lower investment? Uh, I, can, uh, Zach Look, I think it's a great question and, and I think the answer to that is partially yes. I think that you know, we're obviously always looking at our clients' actual cost of capital and running all the analysis and, and uh, taking a point of view as to what it is. I would say almost invariably to a client, the clients have a stickier cost of capital they think is higher than, you know, their hurdle rates are higher than what we think is appropriate or, you know, current, I guess maybe is the right way to say it. Right, so for a lot of clients, we'll go to them and say, look, we've calculated your cost of capital, here's the, you know, here it is, and we think it's 7.8%. And they'll say, no, 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 that's not right, it's 10. I'm like, well, no, it's not, it's 7.8. And they'll, you know, there's a robust discussion about what it is, and obviously if you have a, a whack that's 10% relative to one that's 7.8, you're gonna make very different investment decisions, right? And the other, the other important point that people struggle with a little bit, so yeah, I think there is a little bit of a historical 
view there, and I, and I have some sympathy for it because basically what it suggests is just because, you know, forget the beta and the equity side now, but on the debt side, you know, basically people are saying, well, just because rates are low now, you know, I'm buying a project that I'm going to hold for 20 years, so shouldn't I be applying the cost of capital to that project that's reflective of the, you know, the hold period? Okay, I mean, there's some logic behind that. I guess most academicians would suggest, well, no, the cost of capital, you're deploying that right now, and so the cost of capital that's relevant is the cost of getting that capital today. Right? The fact that you're buying a project that's going to inure to your benefit for 20, 30 years is interesting, but not relevant. Uh, the, other, the other piece that people choke on a little bit is, let's say I, I'm running a company and my corporate ROIC is what, 14%. Right? And then I go ahead and I, I find this project, and the project is, seems to throw off a return on invested capital of 11. Right? So they said, well, I can't do that because it's bringing down my corporate ROIC. My view is, so what? I mean, that, the, the corporate ROIC has got nothing to do with anything. What's relevant is that here's a project. It's costing you something. It's benefiting you something. As long as the benefit <coughs> outruns the cost, and you don't have any other better projects that you could be doing, there's your answer. But, Patrick is nodding here. because Somebody paid attention to corporate finance class, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but people struggle with that, right? Because they say, well, I'm going to get skewered by my investors. And then I think, because I'm bringing down my ROIC as a corporate matter, um, and some investors do react to that negatively, right? And I think the last piece is, uh, is a more difficult one to justify. And I, and, I, and I do see clients that are very keenly aware and very focused on the fact that they're pursuing projects that may or may not have a return on invested capital that ultimately meets their hurdles, whack or otherwise, right? So they look out over the years and they say, well, the next five years, tough to justify because the, you know, the, the, just that, the ROIC does not face the whack. But if you overlay an investor perspective, I mean, there is sometimes an argument which says, yeah, but if you buy this business, even though it looks like a, you know, a tough investment on that one metric, if you buy this business, it actually will be well received by investors for these following four reasons. And your PE will fundamentally get a re-rating, right? So even though you're doing something which appears to be a tough investment, and I think this is where the professors will get to cringe a little bit, but I think that if you're doing something that you know, doesn't outpace your cost of capital, there still may be a rationale to pursue it because you're ultimately, your, your stock price and, and the value as a result and the yield as a result that you're returning could actually be positively influenced. That's a tougher argument. It's always difficult to say, you know, investors are going to react positively. You're going to have a pop in your PE. Uh, you got to be real sure that you know what you're talking about if you're you know, putting that forward in front of a client, but it's got some merit in certain occasions. I'm going to give the professors a, t uh, a chance to respond, but before I do that, Jennifer, you actually, um, in fact, I think you threw out a number um, uh, earlier in some of your comments about how you believed um, that you felt your cost of capital was 11%, yeah. an absolute cost of capital, even though um, many people academically, when they think about cost of capital, it is in, um, in, in relation to the risk-free rate um, and, and, of course, risk premium. What are some of the pressures that, um, that, that prompt you to think about your, cap uh, your cost of capital in those terms? Well, it's, I, I mean, some of it is driven by the minimum amount of capital we are required to hold regardless of what our risk profile looks like. So you bring in a very valid point, and it also goes to Michael's point, when you're looking at investments, uh, y you've got to take the risk-reward parameters as well, you'd think, as a normal business person. However, regulatory capital is at minimums that are pre Describe so they have to be at a level regardless of what the market will bear and whatever your risk profile looks like. So when, I mean, I think the thing that bothers us is that if you look at our balance sheet or you look at, you know, Credit Suisse's balance sheet or Morgan Stanley's balance sheet, it's very, very different in composition than what it used to look like. It is much shorter term. Uh, in some ways, it's much lower risk. You look at the VARs of these firms, so their trading assets have much less risk, yet we're all holding two to three times more capital than we had previously. So when I throw out a 10 to 11% cost of capital, that is the period that is not risk adjusted regardless of what I hold given the regulatory environment, which is a very long-winded way of saying, it's more art than science. And yeah, as all of us who have studied corporate finance, it drives you crazy. But there's not a lot you can do because if the regulators are saying hold this much, regardless of what you look like, that's what you hold. 
and the market, you know, our equity, I mean, since I started, we were at five, and uh, our friend Warren Buffett threw in five billion, nice trade that he did there. We're now at 1720 or something like that. And part of that is because the market understands we have way more capital, way less risk, way more liquidity, you know, despite what you guys were saying about us being gone fairly soon, um, I think we're around to stay. So the market has picked up in the equity price what our equity is worth. That is not cost of capital for a bank. Yeah, so there are, stru bank. So there are structural considerations, regulatory in terms of a bank. For the private equity guys, Mark Logley referenced this. There is an absolute 10% rate of return that we must meet. It'd be interesting to sort of see if over time the markets adjust, I suspect not, by the way, but whether the markets adjust into the lower interest rate environment and decide to lower the hurdle, okay? Um, but if not, then there are some really interesting implications for um, how someone thinks about their effective cost of capital, notwithstanding what the capital asset pricing model or any other arbitrage model might say your, capital, your cost of capital is. Uh, Neng or Patrick, you want to weigh in here? Yeah, uh, let me weigh in on the on the the, 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 the cost of funding for for banks. And also, um, say I, I didn't mean to say that you were going to be out of business. I meant, I meant to be a, a remark about the banking industry as a whole. We're choking it. That's the point I wanted to make. Yeah, you're absolutely uh, So, um, but on on your point about the um, uh, cost of funding, so there's been a big debate. You're sure you're aware of it uh, uh, around Modigliani Miller. Uh, as it applies to banks, uh, and in my view, uh, an uh, overemphasis on Modigliani Miller, um, making the point essentially that uh, you take uh, operating risk as given, uh, you delever, uh, that means a lower, uh, uh, lower required ra rate of return on equity, just because the equity beta has gone down. That was sort of the logic. I think uh, what we, we've heard, what we're hearing from Jennifer is that, well, that's not really what happened. We haven't seen, well, a little bit, right? The, the required rate of return was more like 15% before the crisis. Now it's, what are you saying, 11 for equity? I would think. Yeah. I mean, if you look at McKinsey, though, they say that most banks, universal banks that have both commercial, uh, retail, and investment bank, they say the maximum they'll be able to earn over time is 8 to 9%. That's McKinsey. I hope I don't. I, I hope that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but the then point you're not is, covering right. your cost of capital. no, exactly. <laughs> then you're not covering it exactly. So, but, but the, the point is that uh, we we have to uh, factor into the cost of capital um, the fact that um, bank balance sheets are opaque. Uh, they're hard to value, and uh, coming out of a financial crisis with a lot of uncertainty to what's going to happen to, to banks, uh, investors are uh, very conservative, and I think that's what you're seeing. Um, and, and, that's, uh, and, and, and that's what makes, it, makes it the, the cost of the uh, increased um, tier one uh, equity requirement so much, uh, so much uh, worse, because you're not getting any benefit on, in terms of lowering the required rate of return on equity, no. and you're, ha you're forced to hold. Well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, banks, banks don't follow the textbook model yeah. right now. I, I think that it will revert to the norm, but right now, uh, the cost of capital is higher than it should be. The equity markets are giving us a bit of the benefit of the doubt, but there, when there's still regulatory uncertainty as to where are they going to stop and what are the international going to collaborate, you know, when that uncertainty is out there, you they're always going to, there, there's an uncertainty premium that you're paying in your cost. Right, exactly. And that, you know, again, that will normalize. Right, we're going to need to wind up here in a bit, but um, bef I'm going to reserve the right for, to the last question, but to the penultimate question, is there one more question out there, um, a burning question somebody might be asked, uh, wanting to ask? No one. All right. Well, then look, um, the question I have for uh, each of the panelists is the following, uh, and I'd ask you uh, to have fun with it. In other words, this is probably the one, one, one question where I'll, I'll ask the, uh, the panelists to stick their neck out a bit in, in the interest of just being provocative and fun. But um, looking forward to 2015, what do you see as being the corporate finance story of 2015? 
I'm the one who has to stick the deck Please, out Please, well, <laughs> feel free. Yeah, sure. that, I'm not used to that kind of forecasting. Uh, it's, uh, it's, at, at one level, it's a very easy exercise, but at another level, it's very perilous because most of the time, yeah, the predictions you make are wrong. Um, so um, my, my best guess is just uh, looking at uh, where the trend, trends are today and then just uh, extrapolating. I, I think that uh, um, we're going to see a growth pick up in the US uh, and uh, we're going to see hopefully investment pick up and we're going to see um, more M&A activity notwithstanding I guess that, that's where I'm sticking my neck out, uh, mm -hmm. what, what you said about uh, what's holding back uh, M&A activity. Yeah. Look, I, I'm not sure I see any major exogenous event. I mean, from my perspective, I do think, uh, and I've been pretty bearish on kind of the, the snapback, if you will, of M&A, because I think that, uh, I think unless you have all the underpinnings, you know, kind of the global economy, unless you have the global equity markets in the kind of shape that they're going to allow for that snapback, and I, I thought that we'd have kind of a, a return to normalcy over an extended period, which is so far what's panned out. Uh, I do think there's an opportunity for meaningfully more activity on the M and A side, which you know, in my mind, is reflective of a much more kind of solid base as it relates to both you know economic uh, uh, underpinnings, as it relates to frankly Europe, which I think, in, in my view, is that. And, and Mark talked about it earlier. I think Europe you have to think about it on a country by country basis, and I think there's actually some pretty strong stories there. Uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of activity going the other way. We've already seen Japan and some of the Asian. Uh, companies and, and, and countries take meaningful interest, and, and a lot of it depends on you know the U.S. tax policies. If they continue the way they are, I think you're going to see a lot of investment coming into the U.S. as opposed to you know U.S. companies going out and you know buying entities on, uh, in other places. So a continuation of that globalization theme, but uh, certainly a return to more robust activity. And I mean, I've got a pretty good lens on that because we have a you know a backlog which suggests at least you know some portion of what Morgan Stanley is going to be doing over the course of the next six months is already in house. And that's much more robust than what we've seen over recent history. So I think that's a, a good leading indicator. Uh, in, in the interest of sticking my neck way out there, um, I, I completely agree with you on the Europe story. I think case by case, um, we'll see stronger GDP growth in Europe. I think that will be very beneficial. I think Asia will not surprise. Um, so China is a little more, more moderate than it, it was previously, but you know, steady growth. I think India will still be a growth story. I also agree with the ICS part of BRICS. Uh, I think the U.S. is the wild card, um, and I think what concerns me is um, our current president's response to the Republican victory um, shows that we're still going to be uh, you know, very wide aisle uh, between the Republicans and the Democrats, and, and that, that is bad for the economy. Regardless of who's in charge, uh, it's, we're, we're sitting on a lame duck president right now. We are sitting on a very controversial set of politicians who have a, a presidential election in two years that they're going to be focused on for the next two years. And unless we can have some consensus, I worry about the knock on it implications for the economy. Uh, I think the Republicans did a better job in moving a little bit more to the center with their ca candidate choices. Uh, there was a le lot less of the extreme right, um, so that was beneficial. But you know, with a president leading with essentially, I've got two years to, to prove my point, um, which is, was my takeaway from, the, from his tone, um, that doesn't bode well for the economy. So I worry about the growth of the U.S. I think the equity markets will, will struggle a little bit. I think rates will stay low. Quantitative easing is over, but um, I do worry that, um, that we are going to stagnate uh, for two years. Then, Okay, so I don't know how provocative this is, but I guess it's not. But, so I'll be, I'll be uh, speculating on the, still going back to the globalization. I think I don't know which way it's going to turn out, but uh, I think the money is knocking. It's coming. It's going to happen one way or the other, whether it's successful or not. Um, the outcome, it's hard to say. I'm not sure if we're going to see anything exciting in 2015, either good or bad. But I think next three, five years, we'll see a lot of attempts to, to have this uh, much more integrated global markets. And the capital is knocking on the door, and they're looking for 
ways to, to park the money and uh, I, I can't wait to see, but I think it's very exciting. You heard it here first at the very center of business. Please join me in thanking our panelists for uh, this morning's event.